of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia, and I'd like to welcome you to this annual Cunningham Lecture, the 2010 Cunningham Lecture of the Academy. And in welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people on whose traditional ground we are meeting and to pay my respects to elders past and present. This lecture is named in honour of Ken Cunningham, who was the first chair of the Social Sciences Research Committee, which was the predecessor of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. Cunningham chaired the committee from 1943 to 1952. In his professional life, he was the founding director of the Australian Council for Educational Research, a not-for-profit company established on the basis of a report that he'd been commissioned to produce, actually, by the Carnegie Corporation, then in turn established by the Cunningham Corporation in 1930. And Cunningham was his first director from 1930 to 1954. The 2010 Cunningham Lecture, as you all know, since that's the reason you're here, is to be delivered by Professor Ross Garner. <coughs> Professor Garner is a distinguished academic economist whose career has also involved a remarkable engagement with policy and practice. He's led many high-level government reviews and commissions, including the preparation of the report Australia and the Northeast Asian Ascendancy in 1989, the review of the wool industry in 1993, the review of the Commonwealth, the review of Commonwealth state funding in 2002, and the eponymous Ghana Climate Change Review in 2008. <laughs> Professor Ghana is currently a Vice Chancellor's Fellow and a Professorial Fellow in Economics at the University of Melbourne. He's also a Distinguished Professor of Economics at the Australian National University that last year awarded him an honorary doctorate of letters. Professor Ghana was head of the Economics Department in the Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies at this university, the Australian National University, for over a decade, from 1989. He's the author or editor, alone or jointly with others, of 37 books and numerous influential articles in scholarly journals and books on international economics, public finance and economic development. And it's interesting to see how often he's turned to. There's a debate about uh, resource rent tax, and suddenly I discover, of course, he wrote definitive work on that back in the 1970s, as well as all of the other things I had begun to learn he'd done. <coughs> Professor Garner has held a number of senior government positions, including those of Principal Economic Advisor to Prime Minister Bob Hall and Australian Ambassador to China. Tonight he'll speak on the topic, What if mainstream science is right? The route of knowledge and analysis in Australian climate change policy. Professor Garner. Barry, uh, uh, Barry, now a uh, neighbour of mine in North Carlton. Uh, as you can hear, uh, I, I'm a bit crook. I was uh, at Royal Melbourne Hospital last night and they, and they uh, said, oh, you're going to have to be here a few days. And I said, not on your life. And, uh, uh, and they said, well, even Bart Cummings was going to stay here through the Melbourne Cup. <laughs> Thank you. 
in 2010, neither did so. In 2010, both sides of politics were promising to reduce emissions by an amount, 5% from 2000 levels by 2020, that at once was quite a challenge and well short of an Australian effort that was commensurate with international commitments after Copenhagen. Neither of the major parties took to the election specific policies that held out reasonable prospects of reaching even the challenging but disproportionately small reduction target that was on the table. The spreading of modern economic growth to the populous heartlands of the largest Asian developing countries in the early 21st century was making the climate change challenge larger and more urgent. Realisation of this reality was starting to touch Australian and international awareness late in the first decade of the new century. That was the time between the 2007 and 2010 Australian elections, between the Bali and Copenhagen meetings of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, when fundamental questions emerged about whether the Australian and international policies were capable of dealing effectively with the challenge of climate change. The degree of difficulty had been recognised before its crystallisation in late 2009 and 2010. I said in the introduction to the Ghana Climate Change Review, and I'm quoting from that introduction, climate change is a diabolical policy problem. It is harder than any other issue of high importance that has come before our polity in living memory. Climate change presents a new type of challenge. It is uncertain in its form and extent rather than drawn in clear lines. It is insidious rather than, as yet, directly confrontational. It is long-term rather than immediate in both its impact and its remedies. Any effective remedies lie well beyond any act of national will requiring international cooperation of unprecedented dimension and complexity. While an effective response to the challenge will play out over many decades, it must take shape and be put in place over the next few years. I'm still quoting. Observation of daily debate and media discussion in Australia and elsewhere suggests that this issue may be too hard for rational policy making. It is too complex. The special interests are too numerous, powerful and intense. The time frame within which effects become evident are too long and the time frames within which action must be affected too short. But there was more to the climate change political story than the difficulties. Immediately after that sober assessment in the review, I noted that there was another side to the gloom, and I went on to say in the introduction, but there is a saving grace that may make all the difference. There is a much stronger base of Australian community support for reform and change on this issue than on any other big question of structural change in recent decades. Public attitudes in Australia and in other countries create the possibility of major reform on emission reductions, despite the inherent difficulty of the policy problem. The review aimed to provide scope for the saving grace to be effective, to nurture the chance that Australia and the world will manage to develop a position that strikes a good balance between the costs of dangerous climate change and the costs of mitigation. The, the savings grace turned out to have considerable power. It contributed to an election outcome that made climate change a central issue in the formation of a government. This, in turn, led to the establishment of a multi-party climate change committee with the task of forming a view on putting a price on carbon, and separately <coughs> to a commission from the government for me to update the review. Incidentally, while I am an independent expert on the parliamentary committee, the confidential work of the committee is carefully separate from the independent and public updating of the 2008 review. I've said elsewhere that the policy process on climate change through the 2007 to 10 Parliament was dominated by vested interests to an extent that went beyond the inevitable involvement of business in the democratic process. In the, 10, the 2010 Hamer oration at the University of Melbourne, I drew attention to a change in Australian political culture in the early 21st century. There was movement away from the focus on broadly based change to increase living standards in the reform era, 1983 to 2001, a time requiring leaders to confront special interests. 
It was reversion back to older Australian political traditions and responsiveness to short-term and sectional pressures on the policy-making process. The effectiveness of sectional pressures on the policy process and the weakness of an independent centre of the Australian policy-making process were characteristics of early 21st century policy-making generally, and not only on climate change. Climate change policy was perhaps more vulnerable, but then other policy areas were not supported by the saving grace. Climate change policy has been subject to sophisticated, detailed and authoritative public discussion. The extent of the public interest discussion of the issue, uh, including through my review and including through the government's green and white papers, has few parallels. The extent of public participation in discussion of the issue has no, has no near comparators in my experience. Substantial mitigation effort retains strong community support, rather stronger than for any other reform in modern times, requiring large structural change. This is a complex issue. The degree of difficulty exceeds that of policy reform in most or all areas of public policy, but the issue attracts community interest more readily than other reform issues. The community puts more effort into understanding and as a result provides a more solid basis of support for a leader seeking to secure change. It seems at first, at first sight that the problem was not with public education and understanding but in the policy-making process. When push came to shove, the private interest seeking to block, blunt or slow down action prevailed over well-developed community views. But that is not the final answer. A stronger community view expressed with greater clarity would have been more pers persuasive with the political leadership. It would have constrained more securely the influence of vested interests. On the complex issue of climate change mitigation, an intellectually engaged community is interested in the views of the range of people that are considered to be experts. This makes the community of scholars in which this academy plays a leading and essential role, a crucial part of the independent centre of the policy-making process. On these immensely complex issues, analysts seeking to identify the public interest have to break new ground in methodology. Innovators make mistakes and their followers do better. That is the way of, of progress in the social as well as the physical and biological sciences. This is where the community depends on the specialists. It is the role of the social scientists to review the work of social sciences, scientists. The review sought to establish the foundations for a thorough professional discussion of the issues by adopting transparently a comprehensive decision-making framework the explicit premises made the explicit framework made the premises, logic and information leading to decisions transparent for all to see and to criticize. Uh, I said set out what I was trying to do in the introduction of the review and I quote, uh, no answers to questions as complex and difficult as those introduced here would seem right or palatable to everyone. Perhaps no answers with their many parts would seem right or palatable to anyone. Many will disagree with elements or the whole of the conclusions of the review. <coughs> Many will disagree with the policy proposals that flow from the conclusions. Tempting though it is to do so, it is neither rational nor helpful to reject conclusions because we do not like them. <coughs> conclusions will only be wrong if the premises, information or logic leading to them are wrong. The review is sought to be clear in this premises, inf information and methodology so that they can be contested transparently. If the subsequent public policy debates follows these lines, it will improve the chances. Um, uh, of Australian and other governments taking good decisions in the year ahead on a sound basis and with widespread community support. If there is to be success in the second attempt to introduce efficient economy-wide approaches to substantial uh, reduction in emissions, there will need to be a stronger and clearer message from the independent centre of the polity. This evening, I will summarise the review's methodology, which I hope will encourage my colleagues and others to go back to the original text, especially chapter one, to identify and to talk about criticisms and to make criticisms of the flaws or in the absence of flaws 
to support the approach. I will then take up one fundamental issue of methodology that came up explicitly or implicitly in discussion of the review the last time around, the rate at which future costs and benefits are discounted. The discussion of discount rates raises questions about the treatment of uncertainty and also about the relationship between the public interest in mitigation in Australia and the actions and reactions of the rest of the world. And I've got quite a long discussion of uh, how you value the future compared with the present in the written version of this. It would be too long, take too long to read it all now, but those <coughs> who are interested in getting into more detail are invited to uh, look at the written text. The re review began uh, with the presentation of a decision making framework within which the work was developed. One central question was posed. Uh, what extent of mitigation with Australia playing a proportionate part provides the greatest excess of gains from reduced risks of climate change and the cost of mitigation? The question was asked from the perspective of the Australian national interest. This was a different perspective around a different question to that asked in other studies studies on the extent to which mitigation was justified. For example, the Stern Report and uh, the major work of Nordhaus and Klein earlier on. <coughs> These studies addressed the question of whether mitigation action was justified for the world as a whole, which turns out to be an easier question than whether mitigation action is justified from the point of view of an individual country. An assessment of whether mitigation is justified for an individual country must deal with all of the complexities that Stern addressed to the world as a whole, plus one, and that additional source of complexity is perhaps the most difficult of all. The relevant mitigation is global. Single countries' action is relevant only in its direct and indirect contribution to global mitigation. Each country's evaluation of whether some mitigation action of its own is justified depends on its assessment of the interaction between its own decision and those of others. It's not viable for Australia to develop world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases per head of population and the developed country that was shown by the review's analysis to benefit most from strong mitigation to free ride on other countries. Australia has to do its proportionate part in a global mitigation effort. Global mitigation won't happen if a high emitting developed country like Australia doesn't play its proportionate the costs of Australian mitigation depend on the size of its proportionate part in global mitigation. What, uh, what would be Australia's proportionate part? The review devoted three chapters to defining principles that had prospects of being the basis for agreement among the countries that would need to be parties to contribute substantially to an effective global effort. They would, this would need to cover all of the major countries developed and developing. Only prospects, because what in the end is possible, depends on complex dynamics of international relations. The review proposed, proposed to allocate entitlements to a, to a limited budget of greenhouse gas emissions on the basis of a concept uh, I described as modified contraction and convergence, accompanied by side payments to some developing countries in the form of support for adaptation to inevitable climate change and for utilisation of low emissions technologies. The proportion of contribution that Australia would need to make to the global effort within that framework would be a 25% reduction in emissions from 2000 levels by 2020 and a 90% reduction by 2050. If there were no global agreement consistent with this ambitious objective, it was proposed that Australia should adopt commitments that were proportionate to those of us in a more limited international agreement. Failing any international agreement for the time being should help to keep hopes of agreement alive by unilaterally working towards a domestic mitigation target of reducing emissions by 5% from 2000 levels by 2020. Would the substantial Australian cost of mitigation exceed the benefits of climate change costs avoided? A contribution towards the answer to this question was to be made through the review's cooperation with the Australian <coughs> Treasury on modelling the cost of mitigation and the review's own modelling of benefits. The, uh, the work on the cost of mitigation joint modelling exercise with Treasury, the work on the, the benefits from avoided climate change was done only within the review. Uh, taken together, these modelling exercises were the most detailed, comprehensive and long-dated modelling exercises ever, ever undertaken. 
going uh, right through to the end of this century. The cost of mitigation came through conventional economic channels, which are readily amenable to general equilibrium modelling. The benefits of mitigation are the avoided costs of climate change. The review identified four distinct types of benefits of mitigation, which can also be regarded as the avoided costs of climate change. Only one of these is amenable to standard quantitative analysis. And uh, that's where I come to think of the struggles of Ken Cunningham. Uh, type 1 benefits of mitigation, what I call type 1, comprise currently measurable market impacts of climate change which were avoided by specified degrees of mitigation because they are confined to reduce climate change costs only after the end of the 21st century. They exclude all benefits of mitigation beyond the beginning of the 22nd century. Type 2 benefits are similar in nature to type 1, comprising economic costs of climate change and benefits of mitigation experienced through markets and in principle amenable to quantitative analysis using standard, standard modeling techniques. However, these are items where we don't currently have the data to comprehensively to model effects. The review discusses at length the uncertainties in the science both type 1 and type 2 costs of climate change and benefits of mitigation are calculated from the medians or the means of the probability distribution to the possible outcomes that are derived from the science. The uncertainty means that actual costs of avoidable climate change are likely to be smaller or larger than the median from which the costs and benefits have been calculated. Humans facing uncertainty about outcomes that potentially have a large effect on their welfare tend to be risk averse are prepared to pay more than the expected value of possible large and negative outcomes to avoid them. This explains the existence of insurance taken through private markets by individuals and firms. We also see an insurance motive in a number of areas of public expenditure, for example, through the defence forces. The insurance value of mitigation is a type 3 cost of avoidable climate change and benefit of mitigation. The review did not seek to measure the value of type 3 or insurance effects. Rather, it sought to draw attention to their high value. Maybe they would have been brought to account more strongly in the policy discussion if we'd made crude quantitative estimates of them. Some other economists see insurance against bad and possibly catastrophic outcomes, type 3 effects, as the largest element of the case for mitigation. Type 4 avoidable costs of climate change and benefits of mitigation are impossible to measure and more difficult even than type 3 to bring to account in analysis. But to most people, when they turn their minds to them, are of great importance. And the type 4 effects are, uh, are uh, uh, effects that uh, uh, are experienced through processes other than markets. Um, the review evoked an old tradition in the social sciences and assessed outcomes of policy in terms of utility. We can think of an Australian utility function as rising with consumption of goods and services and also with a number of non-monetary services. The non-monetary services related to climate include environmental amenity, longevity, health, and also welfare of non-Australians. Modeling was based on uh, work obtained with Michael and others at the ANU showed that um, the temperatures uh, would be associated with unmitigated climate change. deaths uh, through, uh, uh, through, through warmer conditions. Uh, in the modelling, that doesn't come out as a cost. I'd even say it's a cost. Uh, but most of, us, uh, uh, most of us would nevertheless see value in longevity. Um, so how much do Australians value the existence uh, of the Great Barrier Reef and the Mengaloo Reef or the continuation of town and rural life in the heartland of old Australia in the Murray Darling Basin. If uh, with climate change we don't have them, uh, how much will we be prepared to keep them? Non-market services tend to be what economists call superior goods in that the relative value of the people assigned to them rises with incomes. If, as expected, average incomes of Australians continue to rise through the 21st century, higher value will come to be placed on preservation of the natural estate. 
it is likely then that people will be willing to trade increasing amounts of material incomes for specified improvements of services available through the market processes. Uh, so uh, I had a, uh, a figure uh, uh, in, in the decision making framework chapter and that illustrated the uh, uh, four types of, uh, of costs of climate change. Um, uh, you, you, uh, here we relate utility on the uh, uh, vertical axis, uh, time on the horizontal axis, uh, and we can see type one, type two, type three, and type four effects as uh, uh, successively uh, reducing um, overall utility. Um, so. Uh, one reason for setting out the four types of cost of climate change and potential benefit of mitigation was to avoid the tendency to focus only on effects that can be measured more or less precisely and to ignore the immeasurable. Depending on the discount rate which is used to convert future welfare into a present value, the potentially immeasurable impacts, um, the, the potentially measurable impacts, so the, the 21st century effects only of type one and type two, may be a modest part of the potential benefits of mitigation. Um, nevertheless, uh, I set about to <coughs> measure precisely that which could be measured, the type one and type two effects in the uh, 21st century. Uh, so let us now bring together the stories of the costs of mitigation and the benefits of reduced climate change. Let us do it conceptually at first and, and then fill in some numbers expectations of the level of national utility over time in the absence of mitigation uh, in uh, figure two uh, are plotted uh, as the uh, orange line. Uh, national utility can be expected to ri rise over time as it probably has through all long periods of Australian history. This is all uh, conceptual with uh, the, the numbers to be filled in. The blue line plots expectations of utility over time at a given level of national mitigation, which is associated with a defined degree of global mitigation. The costs of mitigation accrue early, and the benefits of avoided climate change come later. The utility curve without mitigation is above the utility curve with mitigation in the early years. However, where the utility curve with mitigation is associated with substantial global mitigation, at some point the blue line may rise above the orange line. We call this the crossover point. The two curves together, in this case, uh, in our review team, uh, we came to talk about as, as a fish. And the body of the fish covers years in which the net current benefits of mitigation are negative. The area of the body of the fish represents the excess cost of mitigation in the years to the crossover point. The tail of the fish covers years in which the net benefits of mitigation are positive. The tail of the fish grows in depth and total area with time. The big question for policy is whether the area of the body of the fish exceeds that of the tail of the fish. Future utility has to be valued at present values. So the difference in the annual levels of utility between the two curves defining the fish have to be discounted to the present at an appropriate discount rate. The choice of discount rate obviously influences the size of the body relative to the tail. <laughs> uh, beyond the crossover point, the length of the tail is determined only by any limit on the future time over which society remains concerned for the utility of Australians. And uh, I was helped in thinking about this with conversation, by a conversation with John Quigan. And uh, he uh, said that uh, most people were. Uh, I age value the uh, utility of their grandchildren as much as their children or themselves. And we can expect our grandchildren to have a similar view of the utility of their grandchildren. And so uh, the, f the future of humanity is joined by a, uh, a, a continuing uh, line uh, of uh, similar weightings of welfare of future generations. Uh, the value of avoided irreversible effects of climate change uh, uh, extends forward, um, uh, not forever, because nothing is forever, uh, but 
life of the human species may have been 